the question, the exam question uh, for our three panelists is, are we creators? Are we creators? It's a big word. And this is about the boundaries between technology, uh, humanity itself, and religion. So you can understand how the panel has been drawn up. We have experts in all of these, <laughs> all of these subjects. Uh, Steve, tell us, Humanity 2.0, what, what does that mean in this context? Okay, well, I think the key thing is uh, that humanity, to put it very briefly, is, is a self-creating creature. And that's part of the nature of humanity. And if you just look at the way in which our existence has been massively transformed from our biological origins, you know, if you take the evolutionary story seriously, from an upright ape, look at where we are and, you know, from everything from life expectancy to our reach over the planet. It's very unprecedented. We obviously have ambitions of conquering the cosmos and all the rest of it. And so if there's any species that can qualify as being inherently creative, it seems to me it would be human beings because we have gone so far from our animal origins in a relatively short period of time from a cosmological standpoint. So I guess that would be my direct answer to the question. But what that opens up then with regard to humanity 2.0 is where do we go from here? Because given how creative and self-creative we've been, you know, in a sense we're very much plastic creatures, you might say. How do we want to shape ourselves in the future? Uh, and this has to do not only with the kinds of environments in which we want to live, like whether we want to have robots around, but whether we ourselves incorporate part of the robot identity, you know, as cyborganization, things of that kind. Or the other option, of course, is to go back to a more kind of uh, natural approach, in a sense affiliate more with animals and actually kind of live more in harmony that way. And it seems to me we really are at a kind of uh, crossroads with regard to which direction we go in, in terms of how we identify ourselves as humans in the future. Thank you. Uh, Chief Rabbi, is there an arrogance among modern man and woman to, to say that we are creators? Are we awarding ourselves the status of gods? Are we out of control, or is this something that we can, you can feel comfortable about? Well, I think uh, that's a very good question, and uh, obviously I can only speak in the name of uh, Jewish thought, and I, c I cannot uh, s speak in the names of other religions, and I'm sure that there is many answers to these questions and many approaches. But I would just like to point out two important uh, quotes from Jewish philosophy regarding this, which I think sets the mindset for, uh, for what, what we attend to think about this issue. One is just the word human in Hebrew is Adam. The word Adam it comes from, we usually say it comes from the word Adama, which means ground, uh, earth. And obviously we know that according to the Bible story, uh, man was made out of earth. But there's also another similar Hebrew word, and the Talmud, which is the uh, basis of Jewish rabbinical thought, says that the word Adam, in Hebrew, Adamel Elyon, it's also a, a, a word which is similar to the word of uh, being similar, similar to the one above. So the Talmud says a man, a human, is called human because he is similar to the, man ab to the one above. Meaning, actually, we are gods, according to the Jewish thought. We are small gods, and there's many ways to explain that, but one most important way that we see in the story of the creation <clears throat> is that uh, all creatures were created in masses. And, the ma in the, and in the story, we find that only man was created alone. And uh, similar to God, which we believe he's alone, he's, he's one. Uh, and the same way God has the f freedom of choice, Mankind, man has a freedom of choice. And I think this is the most important thing where we, we can say this, this is what on one hand makes man similar to God and this is one thing which separates uh, human, humanity from the rest of the uh, uh, nature. And just one more quote of, also from the Bible uh, as an answer to your question. If you read further a little bit the first story of the Bible, the, Bi the story of creation, the last uh, words of the sixth day, I mean, in the, six day, the creation was, uh, according to the story, done in six days. And the last, uh, 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 the last sentence of uh, the sixth day, it says that God blessed all the things that he uh, uh, created. Asher bara Elohim la'asot. All the things that he created to do. Now, usually in the translations, this doesn't come through. 
But the, the commentators right away ask, what does it mean that God created all the things that he created to do? So the Talmud again says, to do, to fix. God created a world which is not complete and created us, humanity, to fix that world. So if we sitting here today in 2015 and we ask ourselves, are we allowed to change nature? Are we allowed to do things that nature doesn't predict? Or it's not in the, it wasn't for so many years a part of nature. So the answer to that is man could ask the same question at the, at the first time he, uh, he revealed that there is medicine. Or his sicknesses or man can ask the same question the first time he realized that you could make the process of, of uh, uh, anything to go faster in, and, and, and enhance and make his life easier so Jewish thought in general thinks that there is no major change obviously this process hence and became faster but there's no major change and we are gods and we are in a certain sense obviously and we are made to fix the world and make the world a better place good. I like that thank you very good <laughs> Ken, Ken we, we heard from you that you were, you were trying to cast this as a question of multiplicity rather than singularity, which is about man. I feel I have to say man and woman because I'm politically correct, but if you, when I say man, can we, I'm talking about everyone. Man and machine uh, working together. So that's just quite encouraging from your point of view. You're not, you're not being held up as a, a tech, tech monster. This is something... This is something where we, there can be harmony, there can be a purpose and something that uh, coalesces constructively as, cre as creators. Sure. No, I don't, I'm not, uh, you know, one of those uh, absolutist, uh, you know, technology is going to take over guys. Um, <laughs> and I, I have to say, I do feel very at home here. I mean, I have to, coming to uh, Budapest, my, my family all was from uh, Ukraine. And, uh, and I'm Jewish, so uh, I'm right at home in the seventh... Uh, I'm Ukrainian, so I'm right. just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I, I do think, I mean, another piece of this, uh, actually, Rabbi, you reminded me, because um, the, the other piece of history is, uh, of course, the figure of the golem, which originates in Central Europe and is, you know, predates the word robot, but had that story, uh, which everyone knows, right, the golem? Does everyone know that? Okay. It's, um, but it's really a story of hubris. I mean, it's really an early Frankenstein story. And it is about the, really, I think it gets at your point, Stefan, about the creator. Because yeah. there's a question of, you know, we making a, um, a, a machine or a, a figure to serve ourselves, like the golem, out of earth, right? Um, that way, there's a, there's a consequence that if we're not careful, it will run amok, mm -hmm. as it does in the story. And I think that is a tradition very much in the West, that we're always having in the back of our minds that these machines, that there is a price to pay, that if, they're, if we unleash them, you know, we have to beware. Steve, uh, are, is there a risk that in this modern, this emerging age, that the human being will have a kind of self-esteem problem? Because in our pockets and on our desktops and in the cloud, we see ever more fantastic devices that actually absorb so much of our attention and that we find sometimes a bit more interesting than the people we're in the same room with. Uh, and, that predates technology. Okay. <laughs> but it, 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 psychologically, is it, is it natural for us to feel a bit daunted by uh, ever faster, cleverer, fancier machines? I have two... Two answers. One answer is um, we have to imagine a world where people actually respond quite differently to this phenomenon you're drawing attention to. And, um, and maybe this is an issue to be tabled for another question you asked, but basically what if people, some people actually are not enamored of all this new technology that's hitting them and they want to kind of live a kind of slower paced life or something, will there be room for them? Okay, that's one issue. But the other issue I think, and this is a kind of lesson from the history of technology, there's this uh, psychological phenomena that one should be aware of, and it's called adaptive preference formation. Namely, um, you say that people might feel daunted uh, by all this technology and so forth. Well, what might happen is people, as they see this technology dominating their lives, come to increasingly identify with it, 
right? It ends up setting the standards by which they judge their own existence. So that initial resistance just gets worn away over time, especially if we're looking at several generations of people who come into the world, you know, always already with a smartphone, right? Um, and in that respect, one of the things I think we've always had to watch out for uh, in, the, in the history of what it means to be human is the way in which technology, as it becomes part of the, the structure of the life world, ends up shaping our values and preferences and self-understanding. So we actually kind of value the robots more. You know, so all the, you know, just to make a short point, all this you were mentioning in your talk and dismissing it, I think quite rightly, that the machines aren't going to take over us very soon. It'll at least be 100 years. Uh, but nevertheless, not everyone, not every human will be on the same side of this battle. That would be my point, right? There will be some humans who will actually more strongly identify with these emergent technologies and maybe even treat it as a kind of social justice issue, right? Insofar as there's a prejudice against machines that have already reached a certain level of intelligence and so forth. So I think one of the things that you have to anticipate is that there are going to be value changes over time. And it's not just going to be a simple issue of human beings feeling demeaned by technology, but rather what it means to be a human and the, and the values that come with that will be transformed with the new technology. And we have to keep our eye on that. Um, Chief Rabbi, is, is the new technology necessarily morally neutral? Uh, is, does it d depend on the, the purposes to which it is all put? Or do some developments in technology cause you to uh, raise, a, raise an eyebrow or to say, what, uh, what is the good here? What is, is, this, is this a good development or not? Well, first of all, I think uh, anything that man creates is uh, a question what he uses it for. And again, I would come back to the same point of freedom of choice. Um, and just to, to, to spice it a little bit with a nice story, and. Uh, if we look back or think back to uh, the times of the Second World War, where uh, atomic energy and, uh, was a very important issue. So they say that um, there was a little girl that was walking down in New York on one of the streets and he met a rabbi. And she started speaking to the rabbi. This rabbi later on became a very famous rabbi. He became the Lubavitcher Rebbe in, uh, in New York. But back then he was just a simple rabbi. And the little girl asked him, what do you, Rabbi, think about this atomic issue? At atomic energy and atomic bomb. Now he hear that uh, it's, used to, it's used for killing millions of people with, one, uh, with pushing down one button. So the Rabbi asked him, and what do you think about a knife? And so she said, what do you mean? So, I, she, so he asked him, is a knife a good thing or a bad thing? So she said, well, it uh, depends what we use it for. So he told him, yes, you're right. If we use it to kill someone, it's a bad thing. But we, if we use it to open up the bread, the challah on Shabbat, dinner, then it's a good thing. So any vessel that man uses is, is just a question of what he uses it for. So that's, that, that's in general the answer to the question. At the same time, there's another, I think, theological question that I just only would like to raise is, is uh, when we speak about super intelligence, does it, do we really think that ever super, uh, whatever super intelligence the machines will get to, they will also have a sense of emotions Will they also have a sense of freedom of choice? Will they have, ever have a sense of morality? And I believe uh, that not. They, they won't have. They will never have that. Why not? Because when I mentioned before that we are gods, we became gods because, in my belief, because God created us. And I would get back to the same point of the story of creation in the Bible. Uh, if we look at the creation, we see that all other creatures were created by the word of God. And, the, and man was made out of earth, but he was created through God giving a um, um, blowing of his own soul into, God, into, the, into, into to the human. And I think that's what makes a man just more than biology and chemistry. Uh, uh, that, that's what makes human human. And I don't believe we will get to it in any form of robots. Maybe I'm not an expert on this, but I, maybe I make a mistake. But this is, this is my belief. And just to answer shortly your, your last question, I think there are definitely many issues that raise moral questions, uh, even things that are already uh, uh, are on the stage and people are using them daily, and we, st and we don't know if, what harm can they do for us. For example, just to give up, should throw up one issue is IVF, uh, which, is, which is something that people use it in a, in, in, the, in a very general way, and we don't know what effect does it have on that, for example, the children that are born from this. There are certain studies that say that 20, 30 percent of these children uh, get, there are more chance that they will get cancer later on 
uh, than children that are born in the natural way. So I think there's a lot of questions obviously raised and we cannot say either black or white in a simple way. Ken, what did you think of the Chief Rabbi's forecast in terms of the potential of robots and artificial intelligence? And perhaps you could remind us about the Turing test, which might, I don't know if that would be relevant in this context, about the, the limits of AI and the potential of it. Well, I have to say, first of all, I, when I heard there was going to be the chief rabbi on the panel, I expected someone much older <laughs> with a very white beard, and I'm just trying to process that um, cognitive dissonance. Um, uh, and, but but, I, but I, I, I like what you're saying. I mean, I think the, um, you know, the, rather than Turing, I want to mention Heidegger. I'm a supernatural <laughs> chief rabbi, that's why. <laughs> well, um, but Heidegger, Heidegger, Heidegger Heidegger said something interesting about technology too. When he was writing about, actually, um, he had nuclear en energy in mind, I think, when he wrote the question concerning technology in 1949. And what he said was that the essence of technology is nothing technological. It's not about the machinery, about the, uh, the specifics of the instruments, but it's actually an ontology. It's a, it's a world view. And it was this idea, he used the word gestell, that um, it, was a, it was a way of viewing the world as something to be made available, to be essentially made into um, a stockpile. That when, when the modern, the technolog technological, and by that he meant all of us in the modern era, sees a river, we, see, we think about how we can dam it up and use it for energy, to store energy. And he was talking about this idea that so much of the way we see the world is how can we control it and um, basically package it for the future in some ways. Basically, we were focused on its potential. And he talked about this idea of availability, that the key idea of looking at the world was always how, how can we make this more available to us? And what's interesting is he also predicted that we would eventually, the, the great danger of this view, was that we would eventually turn it on ourselves, that we would start to consider ourselves as something to be made available. And it's really interesting if you think about that in the context of the technologies we're talking about today. Things like Facebook and Twitter and the cell phone that we're, we're, we're constantly feeling available, making ourselves available. And there's almost this obligation that if you weren't, I, I sent you a message an hour ago, but I didn't hear back, I mean, what's going on? Yeah. So that is in very, I think that's interesting in this context of what are the dangers in, in terms of how can we think about the metaphor of robots or other technologies and, and, and how they will turn back on ourselves. And um, that's one danger, and I, perhaps I could raise another, uh, Steve. You, you, you might be familiar with the, the book that Sherry Turkle from MIT yeah, wrote. I was thinking about that. Yes, and because it has, if you don't know it, Sher uh, Sherry Turkle at MIT a few years ago published a book with a wonderful title, and speaking as a journalist, I would tell you that, no, I mustn't say this, but anyway, the title does it really, really well. And it's two words, and the book is called Alone Together. Alone Together. If you think of the queue at the railway station or for the tram, and we're all staring at our device, and we're ostensibly together, and yet somehow completely in on ourselves, or atomized, whatever you want to call it. St Steve, what are your thoughts on that? Well, the, the way I would read this, this phenomenon, which I think everybody can recognize immediately, is in the first instance, I think what it's doing is it's showing the way in which our sense of affiliating with others has changed, right? So the fact that we're standing in the same queue doesn't matter any longer. What matters, rather, is the social networks we're connected to when we're looking at the smartphone. And that, as it were, becomes the real community you know, so, you know, we talk about virtual reality, but de facto, in terms of where people derive meaning from their lives, the virtual reality is the real reality. If you actually, right, if, 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 if what it means to be real is where does the meaning in your life lie, as opposed to the things you just do in order to get to that point where you can have the meaning in your life, Right? So as it were, getting, being able to get to Facebook becomes the point of life. And all that stuff you do, talking to people to get groceries, that's rubbish, right? Um, and, and you hope to kind of minimize that nature of those transactions in the future so you can spend more and more of the quality time on Facebook where the meaning of your life comes from. Okay? And I think at that point, right, from, a, you know, from an existential conception of meaning, that's where meaning is. And that's when it becomes the real reality. And what I think is worrisome, and I think this is where, see, Turkel is someone who primarily studies children, right? Studies children's interactions with the new technology. And she's been doing this now for th over 30 years. 
And so it's interesting to watch how her ethnographies of children, you know, and, and the point is, we're now with, a, with at least one generation of, of kids who grow up with this technology as defining their life world in a very substantial way, uh, so that they even start projecting emotions and attachments and so forth to the machines that they're, that they're using, okay? Um, and her point, and I think this is a reasonable point, is to a large extent we've sleepwalked, slept, sleepwalked into it, right? In, in other words, uh, because of the convenience, right? And this is the kind of the positive side of availability, right? Yeah. Things can happen faster, you can get things done, that's kind of good, you know, by making myself available. Um, what we've done is we have kind of shifted our, our value axis a bit uh, in terms of what we find meaningful. And we've done it without really much reflection or deliberation. And, you know, if you go back to, you know, all the scare stories that Moritzoff likes to regale us with, right, that's where those things come in, right? Because then you've got these entrepreneurs who are just perfectly happy to take advantage of this kind of value slippage that has sort of taken place as we've used this increasingly convenient technology to structure our lives. You remind me when you talk about virtual, almost the flipping of virtual reality into yeah. real reality or yeah. better reality. You, yeah. There's that scene, and you may know this film called Being There with Peter Sellers, Chauncey Gardner, and he's, he's attacked by a mugger, and he has, I think he has a remote, a TV remote control, and he tries to stop the uh, attack <laughs> in, re in the real world with his uh, controlling device. And, he's and a proto-hacker. <laughs> but in a way that you're kind of alluding to something a little bit yeah. like that. Well, that's right. And, 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 you know, the thing that's kind of interesting about it, just let me say, because it goes back to the issue, I, I think someone used the word, or maybe I'm imagining a transcendence, the self-transcendence of human, because one of the things that makes human beings, maybe this is reading into your remarks, one of the things that makes human beings distinctive is, you know, even though we have these animal origins, we're always imagining ourselves going to some kind of higher place, and there's this higher being that kind of calls us. And so this is a kind of move of self-transcendence, which get de de gets defined, of course, through religion, but if also through technology, right? So in, in a way, technology provides all these new powers. It amplifies all these new things that in the past we wanted to have access to, but we cannot. And so it becomes a kind of form of self-transcendence, and, and living in virtual reality can be understood that way. This is my point, right? So in other words, people don't feel they're losing anything. They feel they're sort of abandoning this material stuff that's just been dragging them down. And those of you who know something about theology, I'm talking about Gnosticism, right? Gnosticism, where the flesh itself, the body itself is evil, and what the point of, you know, of, of being redeemed is to actually get rid of that and to actually re-merge with God. And this is where virtual reality and the cloud and all the rest of it become heaven. But reassuringly, <laughs> and, look, and look around you, people still actually want to come together. They still yes. want to sit in the same room. Yes. They want to feel other people's reactions. They want to watch the theater live. They want live music. And people go to a synagogue to get you. Don't do a virtual, or do you do a virtual? Facebook service? synagogue. Yeah. Facebook synagogue. Please, what's your response to Steve? Well, first of all, I, I, if I understood correctly the, what, what Steve said before, I uh, tend to a little bit disagree because I believe that, that um, the same way a sidewalk is a platform, so I think Facebook is a platform as well. And although it's in a way it's uh, virtual, but again, the question is what content do we put into that platform? So it could be that uh, uh, formerly we used to have a discussion with two or three people at a time, and now we could have, and we can, we can be accessible and we can be accessed for millions of people. But at the same time, the question is what do we use this platform for and what is the topic of our discussion between each other? And, and I think for me as a rabbi, this is a very good vessel as well, because if you mentioned the virtual synagogue, in a way, if you look into religious, uh, group, uh, religious uh, communities or groups, this makes, first of all, communal life easier. It's, it, it's easier to gather a minion, we, we say in Hebrew. It's easier to gather, to gather the 10 Jewish men to come to pray, because I just have to send a text message to everybody the, the night before. <laughs> it's easier to, to give a sermon, because you could send it out to thousands of people every week. So I think, and, it, and I think it's a platform which makes our, our, our goal in life, which in my belief is to make the world a better place, it makes it also easier in a way. So if uh, a thousand years ago a rabbi that had an interesting thought or had an inspiring thought needed hundreds of years until this got to humanity, now it takes just a few minutes. At the same time, since we get so many interesting thoughts over the, that platform, we have to make sure that our, our thought sticks out from all the others. 
but that, I don't I, I don't feel that it's that it that that tech, I, I I feel that technology is a platform and not not something that comes instead of the content it's a platform that you could put the same content onto on the other hand I do believe that we need that uh, you know we need to co sometimes come down and and not to be always accessible and I for me it's very easy because as a religious person yes. I keep the Shabbat the Sabbath and the seventh day of, uh, of rest and since I'm an Orthodox Jew I don't use phones I don't I don't use uh, uh, I don't use Facebook and I, I don't read internet uh, and I'm only involved with my community that I can access physically with my family uh, we sit together and sing songs and pray and and this gives me the ability every week to actually go away from the world of action the world of formation uh, and 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 saves me just one little story I think there was a I think the same way what we are going through now maybe the same type of discussions was going on four or five hundred years ago and printing yeah. came into yeah. uh, came into the world and people were like thinking what what is this this will change the world totally and it did change the world in a, in a big way so there was a discussion I think uh, maybe a hundred years ago in uh, again in New York just for your you guys I'm not a New Yorker but uh, for uh, for your honor and the, the question came up what can anybody predict predict in the end of the 19th century what in a hundred years from now will be the the front page of the New York Times what will be the news what will what will be printed on the New York Times front page and people are saying different fantastic uh, uh, imaginations and one Jewish lady said I don't know what is going to be printed but one thing is for sure will be there they will print it will stay say what time you have to light the candlelights on Friday night <laughs> and uh, you know the Jewish custom is that Friday night you light the candles for, for the holiday to come in so that's that one that one thing for, for sure will stay so I think this is what religion gives you that gives you that fray, framework which makes sure that although you use technology and you're using a different platform the values the human values stay the same and um, and you don't forget what the purpose of all the, all of that is can, Actually, can I, yeah, the, no, I love that you brought that up because um, there's a movement in the U.S. Um, to do um, a technology Shabbat. So I'm not Orthodox, but my wife and I actually and our Wait kids... Wait, the end of the discussion, you will become Orthodox. All right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> The, uh, but the idea, actually, I, I invite everybody to try this as an experiment. Um, I was resistant to, to this idea, but what you do is just pick a day. It doesn't have to be Friday, but it's, it's nice to be Friday. And then at sundown, you shut off um, your screens. Now, the interesting thing happens by we wake up on Saturday, um, you know, you, you instantly reach for it, but you can't do it. And then um, what I find, and, and I'll, I'll see, if the, see if this happens for you, but you, um, around, I'll, at some point, I'll, I'll turn to my wife and I'll say, hey, we better get going because we're supposed to be somewhere at noon and we got to get, get ready. And she'll say, actually, it's only 10 a.m. <laughs> and there's this phenomenon that time stretches out. I invite you to try this just as an experiment. It is really interesting because Saturday suddenly becomes really long. And it's kind of a good thing because you want Saturday to be long. So it, it, I just, and it, a lot of people are trying this. It's a, it's a, there's a kind of an unplugged movement. Uh, do, do you stay unplugged for as long as you can bear it? Yeah, till, I try to usually make it almost to sundown in, uh, on Saturday night. I know I can't get quite to the rabbi's <laughs> level of, uh, of waiting. But the other thing you said, Rabbi, is, um, you know, on the other hand, um, when you mentioned this uh, response, and I think this idea is very interesting, this duality, if you will. Um, you know, I've been, I've been wrestling with this idea of virtual versus distal reality, right? And I think that when you talk about the um, Facebook, you know, that's not virtual reality um, unless it's fiction at the other end, right? If it's, if it's, if it's someone real at the other end, then it's, then it's actually technically distal reality. And I think that um, although there are all these interesting questions coming up now where um, the, the, um, the, um, the transsexuals, the um, drag queens, are um, using different names and they're suing um, Facebook because Facebook insists on using real name policies and is raising all these interesting questions about what's real and how can you, where, does, you know, where do you have to de declare your name? Which is because they believe in distal reality. That's what they're all about. But um, coming back to this idea of the duality in these arguments is um, something I've recently heard about and I have to ask you about, which is it also comes back to the creation story, since that's our theme, is that um, there was something about the, the idea of the tongs. The first tongs were, 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 just, were, were there was a, the rabbis debated 
who created the first tongs? And the reason is the tongs were metal and they had to yeah. be made out of the fire. And how did you, who made the first tongs to make the first tongs? And this yeah. is the kind of stuff the rabbis talk about, right? Yeah. For the, the ancients. And the Talmud is full of these kind of debates. And I, I, I was listening to, to one of them, and Heschel actually brings this up. And it was fascinating because what I, I started thinking about is the tongs are like grippers. It's like something that robots use. And so how did that, where did that come from? And what we're coming to, and I'm working with the rabbi in, um, in Berkeley um, to understand this, and we're realizing that it's actually a metaphor because the tongs are um, about this idea that you need two um, opposing forces to grasp something, to hold something. And so that's at the fundamental idea of, some, of, of really deep thought, that you have to take different opinions, that having one view is not enough to really understand. Well, it, it, yes, why not? <laughs> in, in terms of taking different opinions, I think perhaps we could move to some questions. I, I, you'll have to stick a, an arm up and wave, and then maybe someone with a microphone can come and reach you. Uh, uh, I can see a hand over there. Uh, can we wait for Mike? Perhaps that's the way to do it. You raise a whole other question of identity single versus multiple identities online with, with our Twitter accounts, with Facebook, but anyway, but perhaps we haven't got time to even to get into that. And let, uh, let's have some opposing opinions from, from the floor. Thank you. If you speak into the Hello. microphone. Hello. Hi. I was wondering why, why do we get so depressed when we are on Facebook a lot? Why, why is it affecting us so badly? <laughs> Someone said to me that um, Facebook makes you, uh, this is extreme, he says, it, Facebook makes you hate people you know and, ad and Twitter makes you admire people you don't know. <laughs> but I, I don't think that's quite right. But anyway, on Facebook, are, are we doing ourselves some psychological harm, Steve? Well, I, I, in a way, this, this, this question addresses how, I'm a little surprised you don't think that Facebook actually constitutes virtual reality, because I think what really matters is the identities that are constituted on Facebook. So in other words, whether they correspond to someone behind the scene, I think, is less important than actually how people play out their identities in the medium, which is why you end up getting people so depressed and so elated and all the rest of it, because all the real human emotions are actually happening in that space. So the virtual reality is becoming the real reality for that person. And the reason why it seems pathological is because we still have some attachment to the distal reality, right? We somehow think there should be some alignment, as it were, um, uh, but in fact, you're, you know, what, who you are may be primarily constituted on Facebook. You are primarily this virtual reality being that can be charted through all your interactions on Facebook. And in that respect, right, Zuckerberg knows you better than you do, probably. <laughs> Another thought. Well, I would say, the, I would say the, the problem is that you don't put on Facebook when you got a parking ticket or <laughs> you, you, know, something, you had a bad day. Don't generally post that. Um, so what you just hear is the good news, right? And so people amplify that. But I think if you if you started if people started lying and telling all kinds of things they did that didn't happen, that would really um, that would that would really undermine Facebook. So Facebook does rely on a reality that that there's at least we believe that there is something out there that's happening. It's a selective reality, though. And I think that's why it makes a lot of us feel bad. What I just uh, think about sometimes when I myself uh, spend some time on the Facebook is that uh, uh, formerly, uh, a few hundred years ago, people didn't get so much outside information because, not, because the rest of the world wasn't accessible to them. And this made them uh, able to go into a state of deep thought, of, 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 of deep philosophical, philosoph philosophical thought, and deep thought that, make, that made them create new ideas and, 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 and uh, deep uh, thought to create new, uh, to, 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 to say values and to something, deep philosophy. And when everything is so accessible and people are always busy with looking at other people that are accessible to them, I feel it on myself, I have much less time, as you said too, I have much less time to, to think of, 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 of deep ideas and, and to get into a stage of, you know, uh, contemplating and, uh, and uh, meditating and that's one thing that I could think about, but the rest of the time, I don't think Facebook is a, necessarily a bad thing. I know there's another question of so-called addiction, and 
the fact that we, we seek uh, validation. You know, we put, this, we put our news out there and we want likes. We want people to go, oh, yes, well done. And, oh, aren't you clever? And so on. And, and, if, it, and, and if it's an empty... Uh, there's a no, no, no resonance and no response, you know, again, that, that sort well, of... But that's the way it is in real life as well. Exactly, yes, that's a good point. Another question. Oh, there's a hand here at the front. Thank you very much, madam. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. For Rabbi, Rabbi question, uh, you said that humans are something more than uh, biology and chemistry. Uh, do you think, uh, what do you think what that is and if we'll be able to measure, the, measure this in the lab one day? Good. Well, uh, since uh, all, all we have left is five minutes, I have to say it very, in, in very short. But uh, just, just uh, you know, there is something which, I, which we, we call sometimes the soul of man. And we can call it also life, ambition, ambition to do good. Um, uh, and I think those are the things that, are, that, makes us, that make us more than just chemistry and biology. If you will look at the, chemistry, the, chemistry, the, chem, the chemical map of human and you will put it together in a pot, you will have uh, maybe a, a chicken soup, but you, you won't have a human. You won't have not even a live creature. But so I think there's three, three, three stages. There is all, all live creatures have a certain sense of a soul, which makes them, makes them more than chemistry and biology. And the human has even more than that. And that's, you ask, how can you measure that? That's exactly the point. You, that's one of the things that you cannot measure. So the, in Jewish uh, philosophy, there's something which, which is called in, in Hebrew, Yediyata Metziut, Vehavanata Mehut, which I'll try to translate, which means knowing of the existence of something and getting to know its essence. It's two separate ideas. Knowing of something existing is, for example, I know I'm alive, but I cannot pin, pin, pinpoint what is life. I can only see the outcomes of, of life. I can see that my heart beats and uh, my cells are, uh, are, 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 are moving. And those are all things that are outcome of, of me living. But I cannot pinpoint and say, this is life. This is the soul. But there is something which makes a live man and a dead man totally different. And that's the thing which makes us, makes us more than just biology and chemistry. Wow, thank you. Uh, is that a hand? Yes, that's yes. one oh, here. Yeah, thank you, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, so uh, the question is that uh, uh, whether or not we are going to be replaced by robots, this is interesting, but uh, I have another one. What if we become robots? I mean, AI, or at least cyborgs, so I think AI is far, far away, I mean, in a sense of a computer as a sentient being, but implants, mm -hmm. implants that can uh, uh, enhance your physical and mental abilities, these are probably not that far away, so you can buy a, I don't know, 100 petabyte uh, memory implant in order to never have to read again, because you have everything in your mind, so how about this? Um, the sooner the better, I think. My, my own memory is fading rapidly, so I would love to have that. The, uh, you know, um, Donna Haraway talks about this idea that we're all cyborgs. I mean, if we, um, if we wear glasses or um, if we've ever been vaccinated, that we've taken technology into our bodies and therefore we've been affected or influenced by it. So I agree with you. I think it's actually a very good observation that it's, it's all around us. I mean, I'm actually curious how you two feel about this idea. Is it, I mean, is it something that we need to resist or is it okay? Oh, it, well, first of all, your basic point, the first, po the first point's correct, right? Namely, that we've always already been cyborgs. I think that's pretty obvious if you see the way in which we've been transformed by medicine and technology and so forth. Uh, I think there are two issues. One issue is the social justice issue, especially with these emerging technologies, which in the first instance, you know, people who have access to money and know where the action is would be able to do it. And so whatever inequalities already exist in, in society because of the poor, you know, relative, the unequal distribution of medical care that's already available, imagine how, how potentially the inequalities could grow if we actually just have a free market for cyborganization, okay? So this is gonna be an issue which I think we should welcome, but that, that the government should be in very heavily. And, 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 and here I will echo some of Moritzoff's rhetoric about the need to make this a public good. Okay, because I don't think that's going to happen automatically. I think the, the, the default tendency is for this to just be thrown in the open market and let people deal with it. 
But the other point I would make is I do think that, these, that the more visible cyborgs become in our society, and I would count, let's say, Stephen Hawking, right? So people who would be nominally regarded as disabled but have been enhanced in various fashions, because that's the easiest and most visible way in which one, in which one as it were, is a cyborg, exists as a cyborg in society now. Um, those people actually start to shift people's, again, shifting people's values as to what is desirable to be a human being. And so the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C. last year put out a report basically saying our cyborg future, namely what happens when a lot of able-bodied people want to become cyborgs because they, li they like the new facilities that are made, new functionalities that are made possible by getting the prosthetic limb, let's say, even if they don't need it. Right? Uh, and, 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 you know, what are we going to do about that, right? Because it is changing our sense of, you know, what is an attractive and normal kind of human being, this kind of visibility of cyborgs, especially if they succeed in society. Uh, I, I, I agree with, the, with the Ken, and uh, I think that we are already a robot, robots in a way. The first time we used antibiotics, we, we, we became robots, or even way before that. Uh, and I don't think that's any bad, it, that, that's, that, that, that is only good. In just one story, in the Talmud it says, again just to quote the Talmud, in the Talmud it says that um, Shlomo HaMelech, King Solomon, had a book of healings. And a few hundred years later, Heskiahu, uh, Prophet Heskiahu, uh, took that book and he, um, he um, put, it, put it away and he hid it. And why? Because this book of, book of healings had the medicine for everything and people then forgot to pray to God to get healed. And there was a discussion about whether or not this was a good idea and we see that on one hand King Solomon made this book and on the other hand a few hundred years later they hid this book. So I think again there's two, two sides of the coin and whether or not we will have or what, to what level we will get in, in, in medicine or bi biotechnology we always should remember that there is more than just just that. Well, thank you very much. Um, Steve gets a short break, but at seven, if you want to hear more from him, and I'm sure you do, he'll be speaking in the Spiller Shanghai venue, which and talking about upgrading the body and the mind, which yeah, is kind of your last your last question. So a nice segue. But I'm sure you'll want to thank our wonderful panel, Steve Fuller, Chief Rabbi Shlomo Kovash, and again Ken Goldberg. Thank you very much. Thank you.